Good Monday morning to you. Thanks for joining us for family time. Uh, we, uh, we had a great day yesterday. Took the Lord's Supper. That was an experience for us since we had a lot of folks who were doing it from home. Right. That's a little bit different, but we're still one body, whether we're here at church or still watching online. But it was great to do the Lord's Supper yesterday. Yeah, very nice. Well, today we come to Proverbs chapter 12, and uh, we're not really sure how far we'll move in this passage this morning. We'll continue it on Wednesday. And uh, remember that there will be no Friday this week. This is the first week in which we're going to a two-day, or did we do that last week? Yeah, we did it last week. That's Man, <laughs> it's been a while. I've slept <laughs> since then and forgotten all about it. But, uh, so anyway, we'll go Monday and Wednesday, and then we'll... Uh, continue then the following week. So let's jump in. Let's read uh, verses 1 through 4. and okay. then, uh, Yeah, I'll read those. I'm reading out of ESV. This is uh, Proverbs chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of evil devices, uh, he, devices he condemns. No one is, is established by wickedness, but the root of the righteousness will never be pr- moved. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. Don't you love verse 1? Who, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. You know, I, I've gotten, as I've gotten older, I've gotten to where I really appreciate people who just tell it like it is. And uh, I... Sometimes it hurts my feelings, but I, I respect that. I appreciate that. It makes it so much simpler for me to know where I stand when they just speak it like it is. Now, I like for them to temper that with a little bit of grace and love. Yeah. Some people don't know how to do that. But I appreciate people who tell it like this. And this is one of those verses that he just, boom, here it is. Exactly. You know, and I, to me, I, I thought, thought, thought about a couple words. The first word I thought about was discipline and how, you know, if we're really going to live for God, uh, discipline's got to be a big part of our life. I mean, if, you know, there's certain dis- spiritual disciplines that we need to develop in our lives. Reading God's Word is one. Uh, prayer, our prayer life. Uh, there, there's different things that we have to establish, that we have to be disciplined. And when I think of discipline, I think, you know, they're, they don't just come natural to us. We have to work at it. And as we work at it, you know, God grows us in knowledge. And I think we see it. But the second word I thought about in this passage is, is the word stupid. Now, I don't know about at your house, but at my house, I wasn't allowed to use that word when growing <laughs> up. I mean, my mom was like, oh, no, 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 you can't use that word. I mean, but it's interesting. Solomon uses it here. And he's just saying, you know, somebody that hates being corrected is stupid. Because that's part of our growing process is at times we get off and we need to be corrected. We need reproof. That's really good. I, I, uh, I, I know that throughout the book of Proverbs, you know, he, Solomon never made a secret of it. If we're going to make mistakes. But I think he continually draws us back to the thought, well, what are you going to do with that mistake? Yeah. Are you going to learn from it? You're going to grow from it? Or are you just going to shake it off and do the same thing again? Right. And and so here he's showing us the person who who embraces discipline, who accepts responsibility for what he's done, who owns it and then moves forward, learns from it, moves forward, is the person who loves knowledge. Why is that important? Because it is knowledge that grows us, as you were saying. It matures us. It develops us. It prepares us for what's next in our Christian lives. But for the person who hates it, one who allows their pride to prevent them from accepting discipline from anyone, whether that be God or parents or spouses or whatever the case may be, whoever happens to be in a position over them, uh, it it puts them in in a whole category of people out by themselves that, as you've noted, is stupid. Right. And, you know, one of the things that I mentioned the word discipline a minute ago, and I didn't mention this part, but also when I was a kid, I wasn't too crazy about discipline. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my, my parents, when I look back, I mean, they were pretty strict. They really were. And now I appreciate that. At the time, I didn't. 
Yeah. I definitely didn't. At the time, I mean, I just couldn't understand why can't I go down the street to play at my friend's house. And I just couldn't do that unless I had, you know, their permission to do things. I mean, a lot of things that, uh, you know, I look back, my parents were just very strict. But that discipline I appreciate now and the fact that when I disobeyed, there were consequences. So I started to learn that, you know, you, there's consequences to, to doing things you're not supposed to do. And that's important because if kids don't learn that, and a lot of our kids are basically today, in one sense, raising themselves mm-hmm. without that discipline, and that is not to their, to their blessing. It's not to their advantage. You know, when you, when you look beyond the discipline to understand why, mm-hmm. to understand that it is for our good, uh, to understand that, that it is to give us what we're looking for in life. God disciplines us not because he's a cruel, hateful God, but because he loves us, mm-hmm. because he desires what's best for us. Uh, I've used this illustration many times, but uh, when my daughter was young, uh, early years, there'd be times that she'd be heading towards something dangerous, say such as the road, and I'd stop her. Now, she was a pretty compliant child. Not everybody has that benefit, <laughs> but in fact, she has one that, that isn't fitting into that category, but uh, she was a pretty compliant child, so she would respond and she would come back, you know, she would listen. But I've thought about, you know, if she doesn't do that, what am I going to do? Am I just going to say, well, you know, she'll learn yeah. and let her go play in a road and get ran over? Or am I going to say, Cam, you know, something's wrong with this picture. It's very dangerous out there. You can't go. And therefore, do whatever was necessary to prevent her from doing that. Because re- ultimately, what I'm trying to do is save her life. Yeah. When we understand the heart of God and we begin to see that God is working for our good and for his glory in everything, even in discipline, it makes it easier to accept. Yeah. Makes it easier to, to, to appreciate. Well, you know, one of the things I was thinking about, um, you know, since we're talking about parenting a little bit, but uh, in definitely I've failed in this area, so I can, I feel like I, I'm an expert. I can speak because I failed, but... <laughs> You know, I feel like today with, um, you know, the fluence that our society has being much more than past generations, that at times we have made things so easy on our children, and in some ways I think we've not allowed them to develop some discipline that they need in their own lives that's hurt them as they get to be young adults. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't learn how to do some things on your own when you're younger, then you get to be adult and you, you don't have those skills. And, um, and that is not, you know, we, we do it because we love them, we want to take care of them, but there, there becomes a time where we kind of have to set them free, where they can fail on their own. And uh, because discipline is something that each person has to independently learn and develop. And that's where knowledge comes from when we have discipline. And so, again, I think uh, we, at times we're our own greatest enemy as parents. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really good insight. Um, You'll move on to verse 4? Yeah, I guess we'd better. One, one quick thing. I, I see then, you've mentioned this several times as we've gone through this series, you and Jason and then you and I, uh, and even with Anthony, how pride plays such an important role, how the, the uh, uh, writer of Proverbs keeps drawing us back to the thought that pride is such an issue. Yes. Pride is definitely an issue in not being willing to accept discipline. Right. Uh, not being able to own our mistakes, our failures, and learning from them. Pride plays such a, a detestable role in this, and it's so destructive. You know, later in this chapter, he, he says, Fools think their own way is right. And that's kind of going along with that. You know, when we're prideful, we don't want to listen to anybody else. We don't want to listen to any correction. We've got it all figured out. And that is a dangerous place to be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The uh, the next verse that kind of jumped out at me was verse four. Do you have something in between? No, no. Okay, verse four. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. I, I think that. Um, I, I think. First of all, I've been greatly blessed to experience the part, first part of this verse, and I know you have as well. 
And so we can talk from experience what a blessing and a benefit it is to have that type of a wife. But I think that this is such an informative verse. Even though it's so small, it speaks volumes to those who may be looking for a spouse. And I think it, it begins by, by showing here's what you need to look for. You need to look for an excellent wife. You need to look for one who's whose uh, strength is evident, whose godly character is obvious. You need to look for one that, that is going to bring honor to your family, is going to bring honor to you in front of other people, one that is going to be like a crown on your head. You sit there and people look in awe. Oh, wow, I wish I had that. Yeah. Well, I, I think you can look at any, any man that has any success in life and almost every time, or maybe we could say every time you're going to find a strong woman that is there also walking a long way. And, you know, I was just thinking, you know, you can achieve a lot of things in life. But unless there's that peace and harmony at home, I mean, it all just seems like it's a waste of time. And it's so incredible to have a, a wife that, first of all, loves God and loves you. And you're just kind of working hand in hand together on the same goal. And that's, you know, it's interesting. He uses the word a a crown for a husband. You know, it's like something you, you celebrate, something that, uh, you know, it's a great achievement to have a, a woman like this, and uh, what a blessing it truly is. And then he contrasts it by showing the other side. Okay, you can look for this type of wife, or you can look for this other side. And the other side is one who openly or privately brings shame upon her husband whether that be through uh, unfaithfulness, through contentiousness, or whatever the case may be, just creates such a, a cancerous growth. It's like it's eating his bones away. Right. It's so painful. It's so hurtful. Well, you know, when, when I was reading this, I couldn't help but thinking again, who's writing this? Solomon. <laughs> uh, do you think he personally experienced some I of this? I think he probably understood. I mean, uh, I, I've lost my tr 400 wives, is that right? Is no, that uh, See, I've lost seven, I, I've, 700 wives or 300 wives, 700 concubines. Or, I, all I know is a whole lot. A whole lot. <laughs> I can't remember the number, but <laughs> I mean, I'm sure he had, um, you know, some wives that, you know, he considered them a crown because they were people, you know, that just supported him. But then at the same time, I mean, he married all these foreign women that were basically like, in some ways, like treaties with other countries and stuff. I could imagine some of them being like cancer in his bones. I mean, it would just have been like a, a pain to, to have to deal rottenness in his bones that, that he had to deal with. So I think he spoke about this from experience. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. That never crossed my mind, but you're absolutely <laughs> right. So then the question comes down for us is, okay, how do I find that, that right wife? How do I find... The, the one that is going to be an honor. And by the way, this is not, this is not one-sided. Uh, the answer to this applies to both male and female. Yes. To both wife and husband. And so it's a learning process for all. But how do you find out? I think it boils down to two things. I think it boils down to your priorities in looking for a spouse. You know, what's important to you in that person and then secondly, where are you looking? Yeah. So as far as priorities, if, if I, you know, I'm a really desperate person and I say, well, is, is she alive? <laughs> then all of a sudden, you know, what happens <laughs> afterward, if she's going to be a blessing or a curse, I don't know because it really didn't matter if she's just alive. And if, if what's most important to me is looks, uh, money, uh, you know, <laughs> We could go on down a line of different things that escape my mind right now. But if that's what's important, an adventurous spirit, whatever the case may be, then, okay, you know, chances are, are kind of iffy. Will I get the blessing? Will I get the curse? Because you don't know. But if at the heart of this we say, no, what I'm looking for is someone who loves Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for someone who every day is going to challenge me to love him more. That's, that's my desire in finding a spouse. All these other things are, are important to me, but they're side issues. Here's the big thing. Do, does this person love Jesus? And if I find that person, 
then I've found the person that's going to make a, an impact, a positive impact in my, going to be that crown for my head. Well, and I, I kind of, you know, we talked about in verse 1 a little bit about families and parenting. I think that plays a big role, too, in, in you know, what you teach your kids or what you look for Absolutely. in your spouse. And, you know, I, uh, for my daughters, I want to try to model for them what a husband looks like and how I treat their mother. And, you know, also for, for my sons, I want to, you know, I think Candace wants to do the same thing. But I think that's a real important thing that, that we are intentional about really trying to, to show our children this is what you look for and this is what you don't look for. Absolutely. And uh, so that, that's another important part of, of the and, home life. And they're watching to see, uh, they're learning what to look for through how we treat each other right. as, as husband and wife. My daughter learned how she was supposed to be treated by her husband by how I treated her mother. Mm -hmm. Now, I wasn't, but had I been abusive, then in her mind, that's what I'm supposed to look for. Yeah. And it, it's, it's real stuff. We've got to be really careful. And, I, and I'm sure, I mean, we've both been in ministry long enough. We have seen those cycles in families just repeat. Some good and some bad. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so the home is such an important thing. Hey, I, I had to look it up, but you're right. Uh, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So I think he definitely understood what he was writing here in his verse. <laughs> I can't imagine the poor guy. I mean, the blessed guy. <laughs> I don't need letters. I understand that was a joke. So, um, well, ultimately, it's up to you. What are you looking for? What do you want? You can break the trend. If, if your parents weren't good models, you can break the trend. Sure. God's, through God's grace, yes, cycles can change. There's no doubt. Uh, but it really takes the work of God. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, please be praying for our services and our outreach opportunities that God will continue to use us as a church. And uh, God will continue to bless that process. Thank you so much for being a vital part of Mile Straight. We love you. We appreciate you. We're here for you. If you need us, just let us know, all right? We'll see you Wednesday morning. Mm -hmm.